Many here in Alberta have had sticker shock thanks to the recent increase at the gas pumps. The provincial government brought back nine cents per litre of the provincial fuel tax. Now, Finance Minister Nate Horner says they'll bring back the remaining four cents a litre at the end of the next quarter if West Texas Intermediate Oil remains below $80 U.S. per barrel, which it currently is right now. He says they'll evaluate each and every quarter. Now, to chat about this in more detail is our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson, who joins us once again from Edmonton. Tyler, for the province, it's a reliable source of revenue, but it's still quite the hit for motorists, including many of our truckers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, nine cents a litre is going to add up pretty quick if you're filling a big tank. And, and this goes back to about two years ago. I, I think Jason Kenney was still Premier, actually, when the gas tax was first dropped as an affordability measure. Um, brought the price down a little bit uh, when prices were really soaring. And one of the changes that was made in the interim is that it was pegged to the price of oil. So, you know, if, if oil was selling for $100 a barrel, gas tax would come off. The government is obviously making more money from, from revenues, royalty revenues and things like that. If it drops below $80 a barrel, then the tax comes back. So that's the situation we find ourselves in now. And, and as you mentioned, I think... Um, it could go up further uh, if oil continues to drop, if the government takes a look at its finances and wants some more of this sort of stable revenue source, which, of course, is, I mean, that's a much bigger issue in Alberta politics generally, right? You know, we talk about this every election cycle. Should there be a PST, for example, to have a more stable revenue source, get off the royalty roller coaster, all those kinds of things. So this is, you know, a, a small piece of what I think is a larger um, discussion that's sort of always ongoing in Alberta politics. Um but there's there's obviously the financial side that we addressed. Obviously, this will cost people, uh, you know, several hundred dollars, I think, per family over the course of a year is what the estimate looks like. But there's also the politics of it. Um, very hard for a government to raise taxes and not suffer some sort of blowback from it. And it's also put Rachel Notley and the New Democrats in the position of being able to say, look, if we were in government, the, the tax would stay off. Gas prices would be cheaper if we were around. Did you vote for Danielle Smith to raise your taxes? Tyler, during one of her year-end interviews, Premier Daniel Smith talked about the potential of selling beer and wine at convenience stores. Now, that'd be following in the footsteps of Doug Ford and the Ontario PCs. It would be. And, you know, Ontario's a very different situation coming into this decision because, of course, most beer, wine, liquor sales were happening through the LCBO or the beer store that's owned by the three big brewers. They have allowed beer and wine sales, I believe, in grocery stores for several years. Um, and actually, in, in some rural parts of the province, you, you basically already had convenience store liquor stores. So obviously a change happening in Ontario, but very different sort of background to it than what it would be in Alberta. Um, you know, we have lots of private liquor stores. They're all private liquor stores, actually. Um, many of them mom and pop shops, and they're also sort of everywhere. So, you know, the, I, I saw the, the interview where she made that statement, and I thought, I wonder how much that would actually change. I mean, I think I've got about three liquor stores within three or four blocks of my place. So maybe maybe there'd be another one uh, even closer. But anyways, Danielle Smith is in favor of this. I, I think it probably fits with her sort of libertarian politics that she's had for a very, very long time. And she's asked um, the Ministry of Red Tape Production to look into it. So is a thing that could be happening? You know, what does the timeline look like? How much actually changes? Of course, these are always sort of open questions, but certainly an interesting little tidbit to come out of her sort of round of year-end interviews that she did. You know, you're right. We see a liquor store and a Tim Hortons just about on every corner here in Alberta. Now, Tyler, you recently chatted with Premier Smith about the Compassionate Intervention Act. Now, this is the, le the legislation that would allow a judge to force a person into addictions treatment. Now, you see part of the challenge is trying to build it in a way that it will resist a court challenge? Yeah, it's almost certain to face a court challenge. Um, you know, does that violate a person's rights to force them into drug treatment, for example? Um, whether or not it survives that court court challenge, I couldn't say, but almost certainly, I, I mean, I would I would bet my little all that there's going to be some sort of charter challenge against it. The So there's that, there's the legal side of it. The other logistical issue that really comes up is, do we have the facilities for these people? You know, when you talk to addictions medicine people and, and professors and things like that, what they often say is, look, I'd love to get more people into voluntary treatment, but we just don't have the bed space, just don't have the experts, things like that. So that's one of the things I asked the premier about. And she said, well, we've got about an 18 months runway. This will probably get up and running in 2025 sometime. Um, and in that period of time, they're building 11 facilities across the province. There are 
post-secondary institutions, some of them sort of trades colleges, some of them universities um, that are that are sort of turning out people with the requisite skill set to work in these places. So lots of big questions, I think, about how this is going to work, whether it survives a court challenge. But certainly there's these logistical things that are happening currently um, that, that are going to be crucial to the success of, of the program, regardless of what happens, I think, on the legal side. So it's going to be very interesting to watch not just the you know, the legislature discussions that come up when this is finally introduced, but also just the logistics of it. How are they going to put this whole system together? What's it supposed to run like? Um, and that is, I mean, that's something that was promised back during the election campaign. It's something that I was watching for the past six or seven months. Um, and it does sound like that should be coming at some point in the new year. Now, you also spoke with the Premier about how the UCP is going to address parental rights and kids' pronouns at schools. Tyler, the UCP said at their convention that they would bring about a resolution. What did Premier Smith have to say about it? Well, it's really interesting because she has fairly socially liberal views. And, and to some extent, this put her in conflict with her caucus, I think, and some of the party membership. So that's the reason why I asked her about it, because I think it's a very interesting personal and political situation for the Premier. Um, what she said is that her view basically all along is that kids should feel safe. They shouldn't feel like they're being judged by the adults around them. And that she also feels that any sort of laws or system built around these issues is going to be one that includes sort of the whole of, of the family. Um, so you can read between the lines a little bit there, and that certainly suggests that she feels that students should, if, if they make decisions like these in school, their parents should be notified. Um, obviously, we saw in Saskatchewan in the past few months and in New Brunswick that this has been a, a challenging political conversation for politicians to have. And so I think Daniel Smith's trying to walk a little bit of a, a middle ground here in, in terms of um, protection for students from perhaps abusive situations at home and also respecting the parental rights that she has also long said she supports. So it's going to be quite interesting. I, I do think it's going to be a fairly dramatic political debate when that comes up. Um, we, we certainly saw very hard battle lines drawn in other parts of the province. We had Prime Minister Justin Trudeau got involved in some of these discussions when Saskatchewan and New Brunswick were dealing with it. So I, I think it's going to be a, a very tense political debate, um, no matter what policy the UCP decides to put forward. The Alberta School Boards Association wants the province to review the usefulness of diploma exams. I remember writing those when I was a kid. Until 2015, these tests were worth 50% of a grade 12 student's final grade. Now they're worth around 30%. I guess one of the arguments about these exams is that they may put students at a disadvantage against students from provinces without these exams when applying to post-secondaries? Yeah, that's right. And, and a number of other provinces don't actually have these sorts of exams. And, you know, I, I it would have been, what, 15, 16 years ago that I wrote them. And, you know, the, the pressure on oh, a yeah. single day exam was just just colossal. So you can imagine that uh, students would certainly be pretty happy if they were gotten rid of. Um, back in 2009, the government did review diploma exams, how they worked and, and what things should change. And, and they haven't reviewed it since. So it's a little bit unclear if the government's going to go back and look at these things again. But of course, we did have a couple years during the pandemic there that students didn't have to write diploma exams. So there's a little bit of, um, uh, not evidence, that's not the word I'm looking for, but a little bit of, it has sort of happened before where students haven't had to write diploma exams and the world hasn't totally come crashing down. So going to be interesting if that makes it onto the, you know, the provincial political agenda in any way. Um, you know, obviously the school board's asking for something doesn't guarantee that the province is going to go forward with anything or, or do a review or change any of the rules. But just an, another thing to keep an eye on in the coming year, whether or not that's something that um, becomes of concern to this government. You know, I remember too, back in high school, when they first brought that forth, 50% of your final grade, you know, with this one exam, we protested <laughs> and we went out there with our signs and placards and the teachers were like, where are you going? We'll be right back, okay? <laughs> we got some business to take care of here. Tyler, a new report says that Alberta's GDP is going to contract this year. Now, we led the country last year with a 2.6% growth, but high inflation and debt to income ratios are putting pressure on a lot of household finances. Our GDP is expected to drop to, what, 1.2% this year? That's right. So still growing a little bit, but certainly not uh, at quite the rate that it might have. And and part of the, the thing that's going to matter here, I think, is when mortgage renewals come up. Um, obviously, a, a few percent, if you were 
one of the people who got a, you know an ultra low um, mortgage rate during the the pandemic when you bought your place and you're now looking at a five and a half or six percent or seven percent um, renewal rate. You know that's obviously going to have a pretty significant impact on household finances, debt to income ratio, those things. So I, I think it's you know in some ways it's not surprising that there's going to be some economic challenges ahead. Um, It'll also, I suppose, depends on what unemployment looks like, what the oil and gas sector looks like, um, price of oil internationally. Lots of lots of factors, obviously, going into the way that um, GDP turns out at the end of a year. But I think for a lot of people, they're certainly looking at their household finances. I mean, everyone is this time of year after a very expensive holiday season. Um, but yeah, there, there certainly seems to be some economic challenges ahead for the province. You know, even with our household, my mortgage came up for renewal a few months ago. It was a 2.79% for a four-year close. I had to renew at 5.79, so 3% higher. And that's not a bad deal for a three-year close because now it's over 6.5%, 7%. It's just incredible. You're right. Real strain on a lot of families. Tyler, let's talk about Alberta's already strained relationship with the Trudeau government. Will we see more fighting this year between the two in regards to Bill C-69, the increase in the number of electric vehicles, or our province's fight against the single-use plastics ban, which the Supreme Court didn't agree with? Almost certainly. Um, I think there's about five things that Danielle Smith wants to fight on, and, and you named uh, almost all of them, I think. So, I mean, this is a this is a perennial thing in Alberta politics. Jason Kenney fought with the feds. Even Rachel Notley fought with the feds. Um, Danielle Smith, I think, has ratcheted it up a, li a little bit. You know, we saw in the last few weeks, for example, her, her saying that Stephen Guibault was sort of traitorous in his behavior um, regarding environmental policy. So there's there's very much been an increase and in upping of the ante in terms of the rhetoric. Um, will there be some more legal challenges? I certainly think that's a possibility. Um, I, you know, I couldn't tell you what the grounds would be to challenge the electric vehicle um, stuff in court, but that's certainly something that, that uh, Premier Smith has talked about. So we're absolutely going to see, I think, more rhetoric, more butting of heads with Ottawa over the next year. A little bit less clear, I think, whether that's going to translate into more legal battles and things like that. But there, there's no doubt that this uh, anti-Ottawa rhetoric is going to be uh, a staple, I think, of, of what the Premier is up to for the next year. How about more instances of bringing forth the Alberta Sovereignty Act? Could we see well, that? Well, it's a good question, right? Because it's only been used the one time, and that was on the, the electricity regulations. Um, so I guess the question sort of becomes, you know, what, what are the issues that the UCP might be really upset about? And, and also, what are the issues that they think the Alberta Sovereignty Act could be used on in the sense that what the act does basically is allow um, provincial entities, bureaucracy, things like that to not cooperate with the implementation of federal policy. So, you know, on something like the electric vehicle rules, you know, what role does the province even have in that that they could maybe step away from? Um, so I think they, they may use it uh, as more of a symbolic gesture in some of these cases. Um, the practicalities have always been a little bit less clear, perhaps, than the, the rhetorical benefits of, of the legislation. So I, I think I think there will be lots of talk of it. I, I certainly think people will be asking the Premier why she's not using it um, on various issues. Does it get used? What effect will it have? That, I think, is a lot less clear. You know, it sounds like we may be seeing an Alberta NDP leadership race sometime this year, Tyler. Party leader Rachel Notley has been a little cagey about when she may actually resign, but it is expected to happen at some point in time. Who would be some of the contenders? Would it be maybe Sarah Hoffman, David Shepard, Kathleen Ganley? What are your thoughts? Yeah, those are sort of three of the names that I hear bounced around. Um, I, I don't think there's any clear front runner yet. I mean, obviously, it would be a little bit early for that. Not a whole lot of chatter from within the NDP that I've heard on who might be the person that they would that, you know, the, the majority of caucus backs or something like that. Um, but but there, I, th I, I would expect, you know, we'll see three to six sort of people enter the race similar to the size of the UCP leadership race um, in the summer of 2022. So that is going to come. It'll be very interesting to see what sort of interest there is in that. You know, the, the NDP had a, a very, very good election showing in May, even though they lost. Um, large opposition, um, you know, real influential part of the political scene right now. And and it's going to be very interesting to see not just who runs, not just what interest there is, but then what does the party look like post Notley? She has been the face of this party, the brand of this party for so, so long. It's going to be a very interesting time for the Alberta New Democrats. And I'm wondering at the same time if the new leader would take the same approach as Rachel Notley or maybe change their approach, maybe even become more centrist. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, 
I guess the question is, where do they think they can make up some of these votes? You know, how many people do they think they can take away from the UCP? Um, how many people do they worry about losing or staying home if they move to the center? So I do think there's going to be some some pretty intense sort of backroom conversations for the New Democrats um, when they try and figure out what's going on here. Um, be very interesting to see the future of the party. He's our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Tyler, thanks so much for joining us today from Edmonton and Happy New Year. Thanks, same to you, Hal.